Divine Truth Interviews Jesus, Mary, and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Jesus is interviewed by Mary Magdalene on the topic of emotions. The interview was held on the 29th of April 2014 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is Session 3, Part 1. G'day everyone again. It's myself, Jesus, and Mary's helping me today again doing some interviews about the emotions. This is Session 3 of the emotion inter interviews and questions or frequently asked questions. But uh, before we proceed with them, I'd just like to remind you again that a lot of these questions are introductory questions about emotions and they're very much based around some basic principles that we covered in the How the Human Soul Functions series of questions. So we'd point you back to that particular area if you haven't looked at that area already before you listen to the answers of the questions that we asked today. Today the questions that we're talking about are mostly surrounding some very basic things about emotions themselves and the very basic three main groups of emotions I suppose you could say and so we're going to discuss those particular things together so I'd like to welcome Mary along, g'day darling, yes. it's nice to see you again today. <laughs> 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 Haven't seen you much today actually have we? Been <laughs> We've busy. been so busy. Yeah. And, uh, and what we'll be doing is discussing these particular questions which form the basis of many of the answers we're going to give to other people at a later, at a later point in time. So uh, that's what we want to do, form the basis of a group of uh, answers that we're going to give to individual people once we've finished this introductory portion of the series about emotions. So we'd like to thank you for your time and watching the material and we hope you enjoy the material. So what are pleasurable emotions? Well, I've placed pleasurable, pleasurable emotions into two categories. Uh, one our group are the pleasurable emotions that are actually in harmony with love and truth. So they are the emotions that you have and experience of pleasure mm -hmm. that that happen when you are in harmony with God's love and God's truth. Yeah. And then I'd put the second category as a whole group of emotions that are all based around addictions where that you think are pleasurable. So, <laughs> so a lot of times they are not pleasurable to the soul because they cause damage to the soul or they cause damage to other people's soul. And they also um, are not pleasurable in the long run. In other words, they are temporarily pleasurable. Uh -huh. They give you this sort of instant satisfaction to suppress a fear or to suppress some anger or whatever other emotion you're attempting to suppress with it, but they're not really pleasurable in the long term. Mm. So if we look at the two groups of emotions, let's focus on the first group, which are the ones that cause you real long-term pleasure. They're the ones that you experience that are completely in harmony with God's love and truth. And what I mean by that is that when we are living our life in complete harmony with God's love and complete harmony with God's truth, then we have continuous pleasure. And the pleasure will be of all sorts of natures. So there'll be this, this beautiful, happy, joyful feeling. Sometimes it will be sexual pleasure, depending on what you're engaging in there. But a lot of the times it will be just general pleasure mm -hmm. about your day-to-day -day life that occurs because you've got your life into harmony with God's love and God's truth. Now on the earth today, hardly anybody experiences uh, any portion of that really, yep. because most, most people are not engaged in pleasurable emotions that are in harmony with God's love and truth. Uh -huh. So would you say that's things like joy and excitement and um, all these kind of pleasurable things that we associate with pleasure, but from what you're saying, they are coming from the soul, the soul's experience, whereas the second group of emotions you talked about was about suppressing some part of the soul's experience? Yes, remember yeah. in previous uh, FAQs on this subject of emotions, we've yeah. talked about what happens when the soul, when you suppress your soul's energy. Mm -hmm. Remember all of these emotions are energy in motion. So pleasurable emotions are pleasurable, if we went back to a pure definition, it's energy that is pleasurable to experience in motion. Yes. So it's not just uh, sitting there and, and not experiencing anything, it's actually having a f physical and emotional experience. And, and these pleasurable feelings or sensations are all going to be based, they're all going to be coming from your own soul, uh -huh. but they can also come from the soul of others. So in other words, they can come from God's soul or come from other people's soul into your soul. 
but they'll be all in complete harmony with God's love and truth. Mm -hmm. In other words, there will be nothing out of harmony with God's love or truth that causes this permanent pleasure to exist. Mm -hmm. So we are capable of experiencing permanent pleasure. God pre created us in that way. But of course, the majority of people on earth uh, have very little pleasure and most of the pleasure they have is not of this first type. Uh -huh. Most of the pleasure they have is of the second type and that is getting their addictions met. And this kind of pleasure is very temporary in its nature. It's fo focused on suppressing, uh, usually suppressing fear or suppressing anger or rage. And, and as a result, it only can result in, any temp in a seeming temporary pleasure. But unfortunately, it also results in a damage to the soul of the individual and the soul of other people. Mm -hmm. And that's not the kind of pleasurable emotions in the long run that you'd probably want to experience. Of course, we're very focused on having those emotions experienced because to obtain the, the first group of emotions, the pleasure based on in harmony with God's love and truth, you have to bring your life into harmony with God's love and truth. And most people, of course, don't want to do that yeah. or have a deep resistance to doing that for many reasons. And so what they finish up doing is seeking out temporary pleasure through the second group of emotions, which are all revolving around addictions. Mm. So like, I feel that if we understand that sometimes we will see, feel like we're feeling pleasure when actually we're in an addiction, and, and it's just a way of help, uh, helping us to avoid certain emotions. And also, if we understand that these kind of pleasures will always result in the degradation of our soul, then we can start seeing the results of the different types of pleasure we engage in. And so in this second type of pleasure that you're describing, which is based around addiction, the fulfilment of an addiction, mm -hmm. Uh, you're saying that it creates a degradation of our soul. And yes. from what we know about how the human soul functions, then we could um, understand that it's also going to lead to pain in the long term. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So it might be temporary pleasure for the moment yep. in the sense that we feel like we're, uh, you know, having an addiction met and so therefore we feel temporary pleasure. But the reality is we've degraded our own soul and usually the soul of others when we're engaging those things. And as a result, our, our own soul will feel more pain in the longer term. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like trying to have a temporary fix yeah. to a permanent problem. Mm -hmm. So whenever you attempt to have a temporary fix to a permanent mm -hmm. problem when it comes to emotions, you will always experience more pain in the longer term. Yeah. So the only real way to fix any negative emotion is to actually permanently fix it and yeah. by experiencing it and letting it go. Yeah, right. So the, um, the pleasurable emotions that are in harmony with God's love and truth, they don't have, from what you're saying, they don't have a negative result. They result Ever. in more pleasure and they Always. actually expand in our place, yes. don't they? Yes, they don't have a negative result in the sense that they never have a negative result. Mm. And, uh, and, and this is an important thing that we un need to understand. If we are having painful experiences in our lives, it's because we've previously probably chosen temporary pleasure based on addictions, which always causes painful experiences. Yeah. When we engage in true pleasurable experiences that are in harmony with God's love and truth, there is never a future painful consequence. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we will never have some future pain to have to endure or suffer or release because it doesn't create any future pain either or further pain inside of the soul. So this is the beauty of a true pleasure yeah. is, that, is that it's very pure in its nature. It's completely in harmony with God's love and truth, but also it has all of these advantages in that you don't have any future pain as a result of engaging in it. You don't have any future problems. You don't, have, you don't create any future pain or current pain for anybody else, and you don't damage your own soul in, in, in the engagement of that kind of pleasure. Mm. Whereas the second group of pleasures, if you like, which are all addictive in their nature, used to suppress or resist or distract yourself from other emotions. These kind of pleasures always result in future pain. They result in a degradation of your soul. They also generally result in the degradation of the soul of others and future pain for others mm -hmm. uh, if they don't experience a, that particular feeling that they have in that moment. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, it, it's very, very temporary in nature and causes an escalation of the 
pain that's inside of the soul. Yeah. So, you know, we need to make sure really that the pleasure that we think we're experiencing is actually going to have long-term benefits to our life or it's just a short-term seeming benefit with all of these negative consequences. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is the problem that most people on earth face is that many times they engage in temporary pleasure, the second type of pleasure. Yeah. And unfortunately, it causes a degradation of their own soul and many deeper, f further painful experiences, mm. which they then try to mask with other temporary pleasures. Yes. And you end up in this cycle of, dis of degradation of your soul, if you're not careful, going down that track. And there's historically many, many billions of people have engaged in that behaviour. And hence, there is a lot of people who live uh, in the darkness of the, of the hells of the spirit world as a result of their desire for this kind of pleasure. Mm. 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 Great, mm. thank you. Pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> what are painful emotions? Well, painful emotions, again, are emotions that are caused, uh, the opposite to pleasurable emotions, in that they are caused by uh, actions or thoughts or words or deeds or, uh, or other feelings acted upon out of harmony with God's love and truth. Mm -hmm. So there are energies that are stored within the soul that can be expressed and they will always be expressed in a painful way. Yeah. They'll always hurt you when they're expressed because you've taken prior actions, previous actions or thoughts or, or had fe feelings that are completely out of harmony with God's love and truth. Uh -huh. so, so that's really what painful emotions are. Um, of course, again, there are two types of pain, uh -huh. and I think we need to understand that. So um, perhaps we need to discuss the two types of pain. Yeah. There's the kind of pain that you go through that heals you, uh -huh. which is an emotional experience of a release of painful, past painful emotions yeah. that have been stored in the soul. And that kind of pain will actually lead to your pleasure. That's yes. the irony of that kind of pain. <laughs> Whereas yeah, the second type of pain is the type of pain that causes you to not to decide to suppress it or deny it or resist it or, or um, you know, distract yourself from it in some way. And unfortunately, if you engage in that process with that kind of pain, you just finish up creating deeper pain. Yeah. And this kind of pain is very, very damaging to the soul in that it causes an escalation in your pain. So, so pain is in itself is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's the suffering that cause, is caused by long-term painful storage of painful emotions and experiences that is a bad thing. Mm. And the pain itself, while it's re can, it can be released from you immediately, if it's released from you immediately, then you'll have no ter long-term detrimental effects from pain. Yeah. But if it's not released from you immediately, then you will have long-term detrimental effects from pain. Yeah. Or if you've taken actions that are based on pleasure, temporary pleasure that cause pain in the soul, you will have long-term detrimental effects from that, those actions too. Yeah. So, so we need to understand that firstly, all pain is created by actions taken by ourselves or others that, and emotions uh, honoured by ourselves and others. In other words, the feeling of emotions, of energy in motion yeah. that is honoured by ourselves or others that are completely out of harmony with God's love and truth. Yeah. So we need to understand that. But we also need to understand that the feeling of pain is not a bad, necessarily a bad experience for the soul because it can actually improve the soul's condition. Yes. And, and also it is a feedback mechanism for the soul's condition. So it tells us that something is wrong in our soul. And this, this is very, very important for our future development. If we don't know that something is wrong in our soul, then what's the likelihood that we'll actually adjust what is wrong? It's yeah. fairly uh, negligible, I'd suggest. Whereas once we know what, that there, there's something wrong, and the way we know is that we're expelling, experiencing pain. Mm -hmm. That's how we know. So we know there's something wrong because we're experiencing pain. Now we have the opportunity to either suppress that pain with temporary pleasure or, or suppress the pain through denial or suppression or resistance, or the feeling of that pain. If we choose to feel and experience the pain, we will release it in that moment. And when we release it, it will no longer govern the rest of our existence. Yeah. So it's very, very important for us to go through a process, which is painful, to release old pains. Mm -hmm. 
and no longer have them stored within our soul. But we need to understand that pain is created by, so all of these painful experiences have been created by something being out of harmony with God's love and truth. Yeah. And so it seems to me that there's the pain that we've accumulated, we've suppressed and accumulated, mm -hmm. and then there's the pain that we're almost accruing by, so that painful, um, the pain from the past that we're storing occurred as a result of some process out of harmony with God's love and truth. Yes, and, and, but it's not only the process out of harmony with God's love and truth that had to have happened, mm -hmm. there also had to have been some suppression of the result. Yep. Because the only way for pain to be stored and not felt, remember all of this en is energy that is stored in the soul or felt by the soul, one of the two. Mm -hmm. We either store it or we feel it. Yep. If we store the energy, the painful experience in the soul, then what we're actually chosen to do is store that experience at that age and that experience will now continue to damage the soul. It'll, it'll reflect upon all of the soul's filters. So what, how the soul sees the world will be through the filters of that damage and nothing will occur until we choose to release it and we must choose to release it. Nobody else can do that for us. Yeah. It is a personal process that we must choose at the soul level to go through to experience to release it. So, so we need to understand that the releasing process is good for us. Mm -hmm. So temporary pain is, is the result of our recognizing painful past experiences and then allowing ourselves to go through the process of feeling them. Yeah. Permanent pain, or what I would classify as suffering, mm. is when you choose to deny, resist or suppress or try to substitute painful experience, pleasurable with painful experiences. And when you choose to do those things, you create longer term pain. In other words, you place a layer over the top of your pain that keeps that pain within your soul. And now that pain that's in your soul will dictate every single thought, every single action to do with that subjects or groups of subjects. And you will continue to degrade your condition until you're sensitive to the pain. Yeah. So, and, and that's what causes long-term suffering. So it sounds to me actually that you're describing three types of pain. One is the pain we're carrying as a result of suppression of painful events or processes in our past. Which has been created by the past experiences that we have not released. Yep, so yes. the suppression of those past experiences. Yes. So that's pain. Then there's the pain that we can experience through healing. So by actually opening up to those long suppressed things or any or, current thing that's happening that's painful or a current thing that's happening is painful so we can that, release completely that pain yep and as a result it no longer governs our long-term experience yep. yep and then it sounds like there's a third type of pain which is as we continue right now to engage processes and actions that are out of harmony with god's love and truth yes then we are creating pain and Perpetuating pain. Yes, and if we could add to that, particularly yep. the third one, whenever we're attempting to use pleasure as a result of substitution for pain, mm -hmm. that's all a part of that third group of pains, if yeah. you like. Yeah. And those pains usually turn into deep suffering, like yeah. where, we're, where our body starts coming out with diseases. And you know, by the time we get a disease in our body, it's already an indicator that our soul's in deep pain. Yeah. And we need to be sensitive to our soul in order to enable that pain to be expressed and released. Mm, mm. Okay, so um, you mentioned the term permanent pain, mm -hmm. which is in result of like long-term suppression. Yes, the, the, if we could use uh, separate temporary from permanent, yeah. uh, permanent pain is the result of suppressing the experience of temporary pain. Mm. And what happens there is you, you, as I've said previously, you place, place a layer of suppression, resistance, denial or substitution over the top of the pain that you need to experience. Now that creates long term or what you would call semi permanent or permanent pain while you choose to suppress while you choose to deny, while you choose to resist, while you choose to use substitution techniques, that pain will remain. Yeah. And if you do those techniques, those substitution and resistance techniques, and those other techniques I mentioned for 10,000 years, then you'll have that pain in your soul for 10,000 years. Yeah. That's how yeah. the soul works. 
if you choose to do it for one year, they'll have it for one year. Yeah. <laughs> if you choose to do it for, for 10 minutes, then it'll be just 10 minutes. But there'll be that pain uh, and it will be that period of time until you choose to experience it completely, mm. until you stop using the suppression techniques that you have in play um, to suppress those particular painful experiences and emotions. Now, for most people, the first process they have to go through is removing the suppression techniques. Yeah. So they've got to remove resistance, remove denial, remove resistance, remove suppression, and remove the desire to substitute. Yeah. So-called pleasurable emotions for these painful ones. And that process is usually the process that's quite difficult because mm. uh, it's a process that you must engage with your own process, you know, your own thoughts and your own feelings. It's not, not a process. Other people can help you, but, it's, but they can't help you change your mind or change your beliefs, which are all based on emotions inside of you, um, unless you change inside of you emotionally some of these emotions and beliefs. Nothing can happen. Yeah. So, so it's very important if you find yourself having pain that's chronic, uh, whether it's physical or emotional in nature, that you understand that you've created it through suppression and you need to firstly focus on removing the emotions that cause you to desire to suppress, resist, deny, or substitute yeah. these kind of emotions. And that's where I find most people are struggling. Yeah. Because they want to go straight to the pain and they want to bypass all of the suppression techniques. Well, actually, <laughs> the very fact that we want to bypass all the suppression techniques shows that we don't really want to go straight to the pain. Correct, yeah. correct, yes. Yeah. So they have an intellectual exercise yeah. of attempting to get out of emotion that, that tries to bypass all of the suppression techniques, mm. which are all painful, yeah. and they all have pain, painful consequences. And so most people don't wish to go through any of their suppression techniques because they're all painful emotions. Mm. And as a result, they never really get to the causal emotion that will cause the relief of the pain. Yeah, sometimes to me it feels like it's like a big, you know, pile of crap, really, <laughs> that... <laughs> that I've stacked on, stacked on, stacked on. And then um, you get to a point where you realise just, just what you've said, that the painful emotion is only going to cease when you stop all these other th things you've piled on to try and keep it at bay. Yes. And then you have to go through this process which feels a bit um, messy and involved of well, like, well, taking away the judgments of... of expression and well the, the thing we need to understand it is that it is messy and involved because every one of these judgments and suppressions and resistances and denials have been created by an emotion yeah we, we want to do those things because there's certain emotions that are dictating to the, to us that we do those things yeah. and so every one of those things is almost like an addiction that we're, we've now we're now having to unravel yeah. and like any addiction it takes time to unravel it and an extreme use of your own will, and which yeah, is something that we covered in our last discussion. We did, and mm. I wanted to um, highlight that, like that again because really you've just said that pain only becomes suffering as a result of the use of our will to suppress. Yes. And so pain will always be temporary if we choose to feel it. Feel it. Mm -hmm. Uh, as it occurs and as it arises in us, mm -hmm. but you've said it can almost become permanent, although I don't believe God created a universe no, where pain the, is ever permanent. But the reality is there are many people in the spirit world who have been in pain for 10,000 years yeah. or longer. So, so that's fairly permanent. It's not permanent in the sense of forever permanent. Yeah. So there's no such thing as a person forever being in pain. So there's no such thing as a person forever being in hell either. Yeah but they can be in hell, in pain for a long period of time, dependent upon their own desire to suppress what's going on. So this use of will again. Yes, yeah. so it all depends upon the right use of your will yeah. as to whether you will experience a long-term pain, yeah. which, which becomes chronic in its nature and so bad that in fact it can cause your own, uh, what you call premature death. Mm. But the fact that we all die when we're, you know, from old age still, is an indication that our bodies are still in a lot of permanent uh, pain that has yet to be released. Because if we weren't, our cell replication structure would all be perfectly occurring and we would never die. Mm. Our physical body would never die from anything other than an accident or by choice. Um, 
or by somebody murdering it. It wouldn't die from disease or some kind of illness or any of those things if you had released all of your emotions that have created your pain. Yeah. So we need to understand that the problem isn't necessarily the painful event. The problem is how we handle the painful event. Mm. Most people handle the painful event through resistance, denial, suppression, or, or some kind of substitution. And these are all very damaging things to happen to the soul. And we do it to ourselves. Mm. And then as a result, we usually finish up in our body getting diseases because the energy systems in our soul have been shut down so much. There's no flow of energy. There's no e-motion, energy in motion. Yeah. And as a result, our soul shuts down and therefore cannot properly keep alive both the spirit and physical bodies and particularly the physical body and so the physical body gets older older or or gets a disease or an illness and dies yeah. as a result of the suppression of these particular emotions so we need to understand that it's all us it's all what yeah. we're choosing to do yeah with our pain with our pain and yeah. um you mentioned earlier that Pain is really a feedback system for us, so God's feedback system. So our choice to suppress the pain is in fact a, a, almost a rebellion at the feedback system. Yes. And then you're just mentioning physical illness, which is another expression of a feedback system, isn't Correct. it? So there's all these feedback systems that God is trying to show us. Yes, something's well, out of harmony. It begins with harmony. the emotional pain in the soul. Yep. And then, of course, there's the layer of pain that starts to exhibit in the spirit body. So you start losing different senses in the spirit body as a result of suppression. And then as a result, that has a follow on effect onto the material body. And so after the energy has been blocked a long time in the material body, you start getting diseased organs and so forth, Dise diseased processes. A lot of the processes are inhibited. And as a result, the, the physical body starts to decay and, and is very open then to contracting certain types of illnesses and diseases, depending on what you're suppressing. Mm. And there is a direct link between what you're suppressing and the type of illness. There's yeah. a direct link between all of those things. And like I've said in previous answers, we could, you know, there's thousands and thousands of different illnesses, but each one of them has a certain specific thing that you're suppressing in a certain specific way mm -hmm. that creates those particular illnesses. And, and if we understood we're doing all of this to ourselves, we wouldn't then go and get a pill to fix our physical body, which is another form of suppression of the feedback system. Yeah. Uh, what we would do instead is we'd focus on trying to find out what is the actual problem inside of the soul. And that's why God designed it this way, so that we find out the problem that's inside of the soul, that's out of harmony with God's love and truth. Yeah. And we fix it. We mm -hmm. choose to fix it. Unfortunately, that's not the approach we take now, generally on the planet. And so as a result, we have this continuing and growing problems with regard to diseases and illnesses, and illnesses and so forth. Yeah. So we put more and more money into solving problems that in the end are more and more difficult to solve because we're doing more and more suppression. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and I just find that really um, fascinating that all long-term pain, whether it's emotional or physical, is the result of our rebellion against God's feedback system. Mm. And yet God's still trying to give us feedback on that. Correct. <laughs> yeah. And so in the end, unless, unless the humanity actually sees this en masse, um, it's very unlikely that a lot of the so-called diseases and illnesses that we face will ever really be cured. And this is what doctors are finding, of course, too. They're finding of organisms that once they cure one type of disease, another one comes up, there's genetic mutations of different things occurring, you know, with regard to bacteria yeah, and viruses, viruses and so forth. And all of these are occurring because the actual emotion allows them to occur. Once you cure the emotion, you don't have to worry about those kind of factors because the emotion is the cure to the disease or the illness or the problem. Mm. And this is why, where we need to understand that the growing amount of pain that we're experiencing on the planet, collectively and individually, generally, is, result, is the result of our direct desire to suppress, deny, resist and substitute temporary pleasure for our painful emotions. And yet, as you said at the beginning, um, we can simply allow the energy in motion or the emotion of mm. the pain um, 
and it will be gone from us yes. in a much briefer period. Well, if you look at a child sincerely feeling an emotion, I'm sorry, I'm not now talking about a child's emotion of rage or anger or rebellion or any of those like kind of tantrum. things. Like yeah. a tantrum. I'm talking about a sincere feeling that a child has. For example, let's say the child injures itself, and sometimes children can injure themselves quite badly, um, where they need stitches or other things. And, and once you let, if you let them cry, 10 minutes later, you know, they mm. can be completely free of any pain, yeah. uh, even though there's still the injury. Yeah. And as a result, they repair very rapidly. They usually repair very rapidly if they're allowed to have that release of the emotion. So a child knows how to do this process very, very simply, mm. but most adults have had it suppressed so strongly that we've now lost all contact of how to actually process our painful emotions. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, thanks. Pleasure. <laughs> What's the cause of all pain? The cause of all pain are, are energies, if we can call them that, that may or may not be in motion, uh -huh. that are out of harmony with God's love and God's truth. Now, when I use the term energy, I'm being very loose in my expression because yeah. they take the form of energy that motivates us to action. Uh -huh. They take the form of emotion, yeah. feelings. Yeah. They take the form of even thoughts, which are energies that have come from uh, emotional Emotion. feelings triggered now into thoughts. Yeah. And they take also the form of beliefs. So, so any thought, feeling, emotion, or belief, action. or action, yeah. that's out of harmony with God's love and truth will create pain. Mm -hmm. It will create pain the instant that it occurs. Yep. And it doesn't matter, it, it can be a very minor thing that you might have done out of harmony with love and truth, there will be a minor pain <laughs> caused as a result. If it's a major thing you've done out of harmony with God's love and truth, then there'll be a major pain result. Now, unfortunately, most people are not sensitive to that uh, because they're already in suppression and denial and uh, resistance to any pain. And we can detune ourselves from the sensitivity to pain. So there's probably this secondary aspect that we need to talk about with regard to the question, and that is allowing ourselves to be sensitive to pain. You see, pain is our feedback mechanism that something's wrong. So the more sensitive we allow ourselves to be to our pain, the, the higher a likelihood there will be that we won't repeat the action, thought, or let's call it the energy yes. that was out of harmony with love and truth that created the pain. Mm -hmm. so, so we need to understand that whenever we take action to suppress our pain, we are also taking a secondary action to become less sensitive to pain. And eventually, most adults become almost completely desensitized to pain. Yeah. And when we become desensitized to pain, we are now going to find it very, very, very difficult, firstly, to be sensitive to the feedback mechanism of what God's telling us that's out of harmony with love and truth. And secondly, we're going to find it very, very difficult to release any pain. Mm. <laughs> so we're really causing a lot of problems for our soul by desensitizing ourselves to pain. So we meet a lot of people who are very proud of their desensitized state and yet it's a very, very damaged state actually yeah. that causes a lot of difficulty in the long term and, and also causes long term suffering. Yeah. Once we have desensitized, desensitized ourselves to pain, we are basically desensitizing ourselves to the feedback mechanism God has provided to tell us that we're out of harmony with love and truth. Mm. And this is why most people on the planet have no idea when they're out of harmony with love and truth. Yeah. Because most of the time they're not feeling the pain that is immediately created. And it's only when the pain that's immediately created gets to such a crescendo mm. in terms of a feeling that, it's, that we can't but help to feel it, that we notice it. Yeah. And that's sad because we could have felt it a lot, more so a lot sooner. We could have felt it when it was a lot lower in its mm. intensity. But unfortunately, most people have to only feel, only allow themselves to feel pain once it's in really incredible intensities. And the same applies to many spirits. 
they usually continue to do destructive things out of harmony with God's love and truth until the physical pain from the actual experience has increased to such a level that now they cannot ignore it anymore and none of the tools that they're using allow them to ignore it. Yeah. And once we get to that stage, that's when we start feeling our pain and trying to do something about it. And this is why most people do not do anything about their emotional pain until they have a physical illness or disease that causes them to feel extreme amounts of pain. Yeah, or limits their um, physical freedom in some way, physical Correct. independence in yes. some way. Yeah. But it's mostly the pain that triggers it. Yeah. Even when they're limited in, in, in their independence, it rarely, if ever, causes them to change. Yeah. It's only when they feel extreme amounts of pain mm -hmm. that they start to change, generally. Yeah. And even then, many don't. Like, so, so there are many smokers who contract lung cancer, and even while they've got lung cancer, still continue to smoke. This is an indication of somebody who's in complete denial of the pain, even. They're in extreme amounts of pain, and yet they're still in complete denial of the cause of it. Yeah. They, they, even though it's well recognised in that example that I've given yep. what the cause is, they're in complete denial of its cause and they'd rather the temporary pleasure of taking the cigarette yeah. <laughs> rather than ex uh, uh, let the re release the, the pain that could result in their health being improved and a longer life. Yeah. So we're, we're quite amazing like that as individuals. We, we go to great lengths to avoid pain. We do, and yet going back to what you said at the beginning, uh, you said that it's uh, pain's created by any action, thought, emotion, or belief, or any energy if we sum all that up. Energy, yep, yeah. that is out of harmony with God's truth, and in that we could say it's used to suppress God's truth and love, deny it, substitute for it. It's anything to, you know, be separate from that, from yes. God's truth and love. Yep. Um, and you're saying any time we have any energy that's creating uh, that's out of harmony with those things that is creating in that moment some pain yes and most of us are not sometimes so we feel it you know so yeah. so we might cry for a little bit and feel some of it but but generally most people don't even do that yeah sometimes most of my, what most people revert to is complete denial of it or complete suppression mm. Mm. and so that pain is created immediately mm -hmm. and yet most of us live desensitized to it Correct. until it becomes extreme yes and from what you're saying if we were sensitive to it from the beginning um, you wouldn't even be able to engage in the act if you were sensitive to it from the beginning so the key is allowing yourself to be as sensitive as possible mm. to all pain mm. motion particularly emotional pain but all pain, because emotional pain, remember, comes from the soul. It's energy in motion. So it's the energy system inside of the soul. That's the pain you want to be the sens most sensitive to, if you can be, because then you won't have any physical pain. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you're sensitive to that emotional pain and you release it, no physical pain will actually appear in your body. Yeah, most of us are raised to be pretty desensitised to our pain, aren't we? We're taught that that's We're taught good, yes. that that's brave, that that's tough, that that's yep. strong. There's and so many social beliefs that cause us, and you know, usually family-based beliefs, that cause us to desensitise to our pain, that everyone's proud of desensitising to their pain, which is being pro basically being proud about creating further future suffering. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's very, very negative uh, mm. to be proud about you know, desensitivity to pain. Yeah. But most people are like that because that, they, you know, there's all sorts of ego-based issues involved with that. When I say ego-based, pride-based issues involved with wanting to make out that you're experiencing no pain when you really are. And the key is to allow yourself to experience the emotional pain. Because when you experience the emotional pain, the physical pain is far less. Mm. And that's a direct result of allowing the emotional pain to flow. The energy flowing in the soul, turning it into an emotion, so that locked up energy that might have began there, turning it into emotion by allowing its flow, causes a relief of the soul yeah. and a relief of the soul's pain. And once that occurs, we have, have the subsequent flow on benefits to our spiritual and physical bodies. Okay, thank mm. you. Pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> what is fear? Well, 
before we answer the question about what is fear, we probably need to answer the question about all sorts of these individual questions about individual emotions, and that uh -huh. is that that all of them are energy of of a kind of a certain type that's stored or expressed by the soul. Yeah. Now it can be stored or expressed, so that's the other thing we need to understand. So it's a certain type of energy that's stored or expressed within the soul. Mm -hmm. So fear is a type of energy that's stored or expressed by the soul. So yep. it's stored in the soul or expressed by the soul. Mm -hmm. And you can do either with it. Yep. Now, if you store it in the soul, then it becomes a filter for the rest of your experience. Mm -hmm. It also de determines what you attract yep. because God wants you to release this fear. Yep. So God's God will try to trigger the fear. God will try to bring you know, your very soul. In fact, all of God's laws, if we, if, if, if I, instead of, I, of using the term God, yeah. if I say all of the laws of the universe have been created so that you release fear. Mm -hmm. So if you want to store fear in you, you're out of harmony with all the laws uh, regarding the soul. And so all of those laws will kick into action trying to trigger your fear, trying mm -hmm. to help you release it. So that's, uh, in other words, trying to help you experience it. Mm -hmm. But every single energy that's in the soul, fear is included, is just an energy of a certain type or that has a certain type of nature that's individual in its, in its type or nature. Yep. And it's usually related to events and experiences and past experiences usually and past events mm -hmm. that you stored yep. rather than felt at the time. Uh -huh. So, but you could you would have had the choice to feel it, but you would have stored it for certain reasons. Yeah. And many of those reasons are environmental. Yeah. In other words, it, it, that we're, for, we're forced to store it by, by our environment. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So you said a lot there. Yes. Um, but there's a few notes here. Perhaps if we walk through those notes. Sure. And then we can maybe expand a little bit on what you said in some of those points. Because we want to find the flavour of fear. What, what, <laughs> what, what, you know, so I've said a very general answer to what fear is, which also yep. applies to every other emotion. Which is that it's energy. Um, that, that either is stored or expressed. So yes. It's either stored or in motion. Yes. It's one of those two things. Yeah. And depending on whether it's stored or in motion, it has different effects upon our life. Correct. And upon our soul and upon ourselves and those around us. Correct. But every type of energy, yep. so of which fear is one type, has a different way that it gets created, uh -huh. a different way it gets stored, yep. or a different way it gets expressed. Yes. God made our souls that way so that we store and express every individual type of energy in different ways. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. and, and this is what we need to understand, that every single type of emotion we can ask questions about. So there's yep. literally hundreds of different emotions that we could ask questions about. Every one of them has a specific flavour because it's a certain type of energy yeah. that is stored or expressed from the soul. So I think it's great that we're talking about fear mm -hmm. because that is uh, an emotion that is largely stored and not expressed on Correct. the planet, isn't Correct. it? Correct, yes. So um, let's... Well, you know, get... it's, there's often, a, uh, unfortunately with fear, it's often stored and then expressed but using other techniques, unfortunately. So in other words, it's, the fear itself is not expressed. The fear itself is not experienced. We often substitute other emotions for its experience yeah and that's why we never get to the bottom of our fear yeah mm. yeah okay so let's talk specifically just about what fear. is fear yeah yep. so you've said it's a type of energy within the soul yes and fear from what you just said is unique in that it's stored and expressed in a very specific way Correct. and we call that fear yes <laughs> okay yes so from our notes here we're saying fear is an energy based uh, or a belief based on an error. Correct. So there are certain emotions that are beliefs based on truth. Mm -hmm. They will always generally be pleasurable to experience. Right. And then there are certain emotions that are beliefs based upon error mm -hmm. and they will always generally be painful to experience. So there's always a link between the type of emotion yeah. and the type of experience. So yeah. and we need to understand that. So fear is a type of energy that is stored that's based upon certain events that have create, both created pain, but it's also about a belief system that we hold on to that it's out of harmony with love or truth. The belief system itself that's out of harmony with love and truth creates, creates fear. fear. Yep. Gotcha. Now, when I say it's out of harmony with love or truth, I'm saying it's out of harmony with God's love and God's truth. 
mm -hmm. not out of harmony with the truth of our experience. Yep. So many people have fearful experiences created within their soul. And remember, it's not the creation of the experience that causes the fear to remain within the soul. It's our unwillingness to release the fear that causes it to remain in our soul. Mm -hmm. But fear is an experience, generally triggered by an experience, an energy that's triggered by an experience we've had that causes us now to have a false belief about that experience yep. from God's perspective. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we have fear about the experience. Yep. And that's an emotion, it's an energy that's now either stored or if it's an emotion, felt mm -hmm. inside of us yep. and yep. not referred to the outside in any way unless we store it. Yes, yeah, so that's another interesting thing you've said about fear is that it affects the way we perceive reality and different stimulus based on only if it's stored within us. Based on stored past experiences that we have not felt. Yep. Yes. Yep. Very important. Yes. Um, and it creates a, a, what I would classify as an unrealistic expectation of our current experience. Mm -hmm. So what it does is it makes us see our current experience completely different to what it really is from God's perspective. And this is when you refer to a filter, this is what you're talking about. It's yes. this filter through which we see and experience and yes. analyse different events and situations. The and emotion causes us to sense or feel that a future experience will mirror a past experience. Yeah. And therefore, we have a feeling, an emotion inside of us that gets created, that we wish to avoid that potential future experience. And, and, the, and that emotion is driven by, uh, sorry, that, that desire mm -hmm. is driven by the sensation of fear that exists within our soul that we haven't released. Which is stored. So Which this is, is stored. The stored sensation then um, begins to guide, actually, our it actions. It completely controls our actions, mm -hmm. completely. In fact, we become addicted and in fact, in, we, we feel almost a sense of panic if we don't allow it to guide our actions. Yeah. In fact, the fear is triggered when we don't allow it to guide our actions. When we allow it to guide our actions, we then begin to believe we don't have any fear. Mm. That's the irony of a lot of these emotions is when we suppress them so strongly, we begin to think we don't have it yeah. when actually it, that's guiding our every action. And this is why most people have no idea what's going on inside of themselves or why their painful experiences are being created every day because they don't understand how much they're suppressed and resisted and denied and emotions and, and the ones that we substitute for them are actually pushing our actions in mm. every direction. Mm. Yeah. So fear ranges from a slight, slight feeling of, what would you call it? Anxiety. Anxiety, or, yeah. right the way through, in its extreme cases, to absolute terror. So, so there's a wide range of types of energy from this slight anxiety right the way right through to absolute terror, which would all be able to be bundled into this banner of fear yep. as a type or group of different emotions that we either store or express. Mm. And really, they, from what we've talked about before, fear only becomes an emotion when it's expressed, doesn't it? Yes. When it's felt by us. Yes, it's only, all of these energies are only emotions when they are felt. Up until that point, they are potential energies, if yep. you like. They, they have potential to be felt. Yep. But again, how we use our will in our soul will determine whether they are actually felt or not. Uh -huh. And what we do with our will greatly determines what will happen to the emotion, yep. whether it gets stored or expressed. Yeah. Yep. And obviously you've said when it's stored, that's because there's been a fearful situation or event or circumstance in the past. Yes, or... with one extra thing happening and that is it was suppressed. Yes. So the experience of it had to have been suppressed mm. in some way, either, either by ourselves or by our, someone or something in our environment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next point we have in our notes is, is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Unfelt fear becomes a desire. 
yes. or an addiction to act upon, to yes. put it another way? Yes. yes. If it, it's not really a pure desire, of course, so we could use the term desire in quotation marks. So, and by pure, you mean in harmony with love or Of course, every a, time I mention a pure anything, yes. it's always something that's in harmony with God's love or God's truth. Okay. So parts of the teachings of divine truth is any time there's purity or sincerity or ethics in our, our emotions, it's always going to be in harmony with God's love or truth. Anytime there's any pain or other kinds of experiences, uh, uh, you know, unethical or so forth, then they are all going to be out of harmony with God's mm -hmm. love or truth. So I'm always, every time I start talk about ethics or any of these other things, they're always going to be things that are in harmony with God's love and truth. Okay. So, so in this case, when I use the term desire, normally I would talk about desire that's in harmony with God's love or truth. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's a desire in quotation marks yeah. because it's addiction. Yeah. And it's an incessant feeling inside of the soul that's generated to mask the fear. So the desire to suppress or deny or resist the fear causes an alternate construction. Mm -hmm. And the alternate construction is we then desire to have an addiction met that will suppress the fear. Yeah. And when I say desire, I use that term very loosely, loosely. there. Yeah. So now what's happening is that we've got all this fear inside of us that we're suppressing and not recognizing, but now we think that we have desires to do certain things <laughs> yeah. that we don't actually have a pure desire to do. It's driven by the fear itself to do it. So this is, a, if I can give an emotional example yeah. of this, uh, for example, a person who is in deep fear about what other people think about them will desire to please other people. And after a while, they'll think that the desire to please other people is pure, mm -hmm. but it's not. Mm -hmm. It's only driven by the desire to avoid certain things from those people. So in other words, it's an addiction. Yeah. It's not a pure desire. So it's going to create further pain. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That's, an, that's an emotional uh, example, I suppose you could say. A physical example could be just uh, taking substances. Mm -hmm. The desire to take a substance, like get drunk every day or every week, the desire to get drunk every week obviously is very damaging to the human body. It's very damaging to your soul because you, you get overcloaked by spirits in a the, in the drunken state. So it's damaging to your soul. You often do things that are out of harmony with love in that state. So it's also damaging to your soul because of what you choose to do with your will. And yet we choose to do that and we think we've got to do it. We think we've got to have a drink. It's driven by this feeling that we've got to have it. We can't live without it. And after a while we tell ourselves that we shouldn't live without it that it's an essential part of our life. And we have all sorts of justifications there as well. And all of it is driven by the fear of a certain emotion. Mm -hmm. In the case of drinking, generally a fear of sadness. So, so it's all driven by a suppressed fear yeah. that's caused this so-called desire to come up and we then act upon this so-called desire. And it's not a desire at all, yeah. it's an addiction. And that's the irony of our fears. Yeah, and what I like about what, how, what you're explaining in this question is that um, at the beginning you spoke about how most of us end up, we don't want to be sensitive to our fears, our anxieties, our terrors, and so we can get to this place where we believe we don't have any fear. Or we, or we know we have a few, but they're not, they're they're not, not causing deal. any discomfort in our day-to-day -day life yep. generally. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and further to that, we can even get to a point where we believe our deepest desires and heartfelt passions are really sincere and loving, but actually they are all in the pursuit of just avoiding fear totally as much driven, as we can. Totally yeah. driven by fear. So I see this with a lot of uh, the men who, who we see in our seminars. Many of them are women pleasers. Mm -hmm. Now they think that that is a pure desire yeah. and it's not. Yeah. It's not. It's out of harmony with love and truth. Quite often they are bending love and truth just to be pleasing the women. Yeah. Quite often they, if they were in harmony with love and truth, they wouldn't be able to please their women under certain circumstances. But they choose to please their women because they think they've, they've got to and they, they, they feel driven to do it and they actually think it's a good thing. Mm. But it's driven by fear mm. of what the women will do when the man doesn't please them. All right? Yep. So, so what might the woman do? She might withdraw sex, for example, which means that he has a withdraw, he has now been withdrawn, any physical approval of his body has now been withdrawn. She may get angry and yell at him, and therefore he knows that he's displeased her somehow. 
and so forth. So he may be avoiding all sorts of painful experiences through this thing. Mm. So he, he then thinks it's a desire. He then thinks it's real and it's not. Mm. He has no desire actually internally to truly please a woman for no benefit at all. Yeah. In other words, none of his desire to please a woman is based around any pure desire within him that's in harmony with love and truth. Mm. All of his desires are completely out of harmony with love and truth mm. to please a woman. And of course, it's going to cause further problems. Mm. The woman's going to become a monster eventually who, who basically demands everything from him. And sooner or later, he'll have so much pain about it that eventually he'll rebel. Mm. <laughs> and that's the inevitable result of him taking such actions. Yeah, mm. yeah. OK, so let's talk about finally something that you've said a lot in seminars that fear is actually false appearing real or true yes. from an emotional perspective yes so can you explain what you mean by this from an emotional perspective or? from an emotional perspective we believe something to be true when it's actually false so for example if i am afraid in the previous example i gave where where the man is pandering to the woman mm. he believes that pandering to the woman is going to create more love that's a false belief. Yeah. He believes that pandering to the woman will mean that the woman won't be angry with him. And that's a false belief. He believes that pandering to the woman is good from God's perspective. And that's a false belief. Yeah. He believes that pandering to the woman is loving her. And that's also a false mm -hmm. belief. He believes so many things that are false. Yes. And, and false beliefs are the creators of fear. Mm. And, because we're, and, and when I say fear, they are, these beliefs are emotional beliefs. They're not intellectual thoughts. Yeah. They are emotional beliefs that are all being generally created through the suppression of some emotion in the childhood. Mm -hmm. In other words, there were some painful experiences, in this case with the man, there have obviously been some painful experiences between men and women that he has been involved in in his childhood, which have now caused him to believe that he must take these particular actions in the suppression of his fear of those particular feelings. Yep. He wants to suppress the feelings, the true causal feelings, which are usually grief. Mm -hmm. And he uses his fear and fear was probably used on him mm -hmm. to suppress those, that grief. And then he acts now in his desires, which are actually addictions, in order to suppress the acknowledgement of the fear that he has in those situations. Yeah. And all of that is based upon false beliefs. False beliefs that he can't handle his pain, false beliefs about women, false beliefs about what men, good men do, yeah. and so forth. And in, oftentimes with any emotion, we may have a hundred false beliefs. So, you know, this is the complexity, this is why emotions become complex. Yeah. Because we often have so many false beliefs that are covering over the experience of the actual emotion that, that could heal us that we go on with collecting more and more false beliefs and therefore suppressing more and more of our unexperienced emotions, mm. which of course causes so much damage to our soul. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. it's debilitating, isn't it? Yes. Living so fear is an interesting one, a group of, it's an interesting group of emotions, fear is, because, it's a, so, because they are the types of emotions that create a layer over deeper heal, healing-based emotions. Yeah. So fear creates a layer over shame, fear creates a layer over grief and so forth. Yeah. And these kind of fear-based emotions then used in the justification of suppression. And so fear is unusual in that regard too, in that often when we deny fear, we then engage in large amounts of self-deception. Mm -hmm. and, and many people on the planet obviously have large amounts of self-deception because they are completely un, uh, unacknowledging of their own fears, which are all there to prevent them from feeling deeper, more painful emotions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's so much to it, isn't there? And I know that as we go through this series, we're going to talk uh, more about fear and we're also going to address some questions um, from fearful people <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> who would like some answers. We're going to talk about fear, anger and all sorts of emotions in this series, obviously. Yeah because you know, there's been hundreds and hundreds of questions asked about all sorts of emotions. And as anybody who's ever listened to any of the seminars knows, often people have interrupted me many times with all sorts of questions about emotions. Yeah. So we want to address a lot of these questions, but it's very, very important that people understand the dynamics of their emotions mm -hmm. and, and what often they believe are desires 
are actually fears that, are, that we use addictions to suppress. And that's yeah. a sad state of affairs, unfortunately. So a lot of people think they're doing something they really want to do when they're not doing it for any other reason than to suppress a deeper emotion. And also often some of the things that are really a part of our true nature and personality uh, we have fears associated with. And so we feel like we don't want to do things that really when we deal with fear, we discover we really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So it, it works both ways, doesn't it? It does. We end yeah. up involved in activities and pursuits that uh, we think we really want to do, but yes. are, are actually there because we're suppressing fear. And we avoid things that really make us come alive yes. because we want to avoid fear. Correct. Yeah. So if we look at the nature of this group of emotions that we could classify as fear, the nature of these groups of emotions is that we use fear to deny desire. Mm -hmm. So it actually, true desire, and now I'm talking about pure desire, which is all based around God's love and truth, we, we are often suppressing pure or true desire because our addictions are substitute desire. Yeah. So, so fear has this nature where we're using substitutions for real desire. And that's the sad part about it. We think we're actually having desires that we're not actually having that are pure. Yeah. They're all driven by addiction in order to avoid fears. And, and this is why the majority of people have no idea what their pure desires are either, <laughs> because they're so full of fear that they want only their addictions met. Mm -hmm. and, so, and addictions are interesting too. Addictions are driven by this feeling that you've got to do it. You've got to do it, you know, yeah. just like a physical addiction is the same, isn't it? If, if you feel like you need a drink of alcohol, you've got to have a drink of alcohol now, you know. Yeah. If you feel like you need a cigarette, it's, I've got to have a cigarette now, I can't do anything else. And in fact, it becomes so demanding that you'll drop anything to, st to, to, to do it. To do it. Yeah. And that's the nature of fear-based addictions or desires. They are all, they all drive us incessantly to this point that we have to drop everything in order to achieve them. Mm -hmm. And they are not pure desires generally. They mm -hmm. are all fear-based desires mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or fear-based addictions, we should really call them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So fear so is an unusual emotion in a lot of ways, isn't it? It's, a, it's, an, it's an unusual group of emotions. Uh, that that we do all sorts of things to avoid. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. If we recap then everything you've said, mm -hmm. uh, fear can be anything but from anxiety to extreme terror, yes. mild anxiety to extreme terror. So it's a group terror. of emotions from anxiety to extreme terror. Yep. We're often, it can either be experienced as an emotion or suppressed. Correct. And then it, if it's suppressed, it creates filters or it, influences the way we make decisions and the way we see the world yes uh, in a negative way always in a negative it, way because it's out of fear is out of harmony with god's love and truth yep so so every time we suppress fear or store it within our soul it is always going to have a negative uh, reflection upon how we see the world and it's always going to create pain mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. it's always going to create pain and if we store it it's going to create suffering long-term pain yeah yep. yeah Okay, uh, yep, so then we get suffering and we can also end up in a situation where our desires are muddled, where they're not... Totally, we suppress pure. our real desires yep. and we act upon addictive yeah. desires. Yeah, mm. okay. Mm. So, so I, I find if people understand the basic mechanics of fear and what happens, then when it comes to talking about fear and how we can address fears, Obviously, when we go back to these basic mechanics, we'll be able to understand them better. And therefore, we can answer many hundreds of questions about fear in, in a few questions, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so just finally, on that point, we talked a lot about what happens when we suppress fear. Mm -hmm. um, but let's contrast that w to when fear becomes an emotion and it flows. What what is the dynamic of what happens there and what effect does that have? Sure. When the fear is felt, in other words, experienced and flows, the, it's now energy in motion. Mm -hmm. It's now an emotion flowing within the soul. It doesn't have any long-term detrimental effects at all, in fact. 
there, there, what will happen initially is you'll have a feeling of the fear itself and remember that will range from mild anxiety right the way through to absolute extreme terror. Yeah. And um, in that process of feeling the fear, you'll go through the bodily process of experiencing the fear, you'll go through the emotional process of experiencing the fear. But it will no longer attract any events and it will also no longer affect the filters mm -hmm. of the rest of your life. And so obviously, if you allow yourself or choose to feel your fears, it has some very, very good positive effects on your life. In other words, fear no longer guides any of your future actions or current actions. It no longer filter, no, no longer are your decisions filtered through mm -hmm. the fear itself. Mm -hmm. So the way you see the world is completely different to mm -hmm. how you would have seen the world before. Mm -hmm. And you also are no longer governed by the desire to meet its addictions. Yeah. So in other words, you're no longer driven to have certain addictions met to suppress your fear. Yeah. So obviously this is going to cause a lot of benefits to your life mm -hmm. uh, rather than detrimental effects on your soul. So basically you're saying when, when a stimulus comes along that, uh, that generates fear mm -hmm. and we allow that yes then within that we allow the bodily experience of that fear and the sensation emotionally to pass through, through us. us that's yes. how it becomes in motion you actually feel you will feel it in your body and yeah. you'll feel the sensations you'll get sweaty and yeah. initially perhaps and then you might shake and yeah. all sorts of things might happen as a result you may finish up crying a lot or, or, or being absolutely terrified and find mm -hmm. yourself just screaming in terror. Yeah. Um, in the end, all of these things are far better than storing it. Uh -huh. And on, obviously this is, what, what, this is a problem with judgment that most of the people on the earth have is that they don't see screaming in terror as better than, than mm. suppressing it, mm. so they suppress it. Mm. And that's what causes the storage of the fear and then it causes these longer term detrimental effects on your your own life and your own health. Yeah, mm. yeah. And when we do that, when we allow it, we have these benefits of staying in touch with reality, mm -hmm. uh, of love having the possibility to guide our actions rather than always being guided by, by the desire to yep. suppress fear. Yeah, which yep. are addictions. We'll always be guided by addictions while we have fear within us that mm -hmm. is suppressed. Mm -hmm. And so also within that you're saying that when we have suppressed fear, we always have to act to suppress it, obviously. Yes. It's an ongoing process of and that's why our, our will. That's why we have the imperative of maintaining our addictions. That's why it feels exhausting to live with fear well, when we're suppressing it all the time. Uh, well, for most people, they're not as exhausted as they really need to feel because the reality is they're getting all of their addictions to create the suppression of any feeling of exhaustion of suppressing right. their fear. So, so, so they're, they're even layers above that, you know, that yeah. they're operating in. They're not even close to feeling their fear. When a person gets close to feeling their fear but is not yet feeling it, that's a period usually when they feel quite exhausted because you have to fight it quite strongly to, in order to suppress it. Yeah. Um, but once you get through whatever false beliefs and judgments that are, uh, have occurred to cause you to do that, you'll just let yourself experience your fear. And that's when you go through that healing process with your fear. And so that's, that's then um, when we have been, so we have the opportunity first when the fear is created to feel it, mm -hmm. but then most of us have by now suppressed the majority of that Correct. And from we, our childhood and beyond. And we're so used to doing it that it's automatic almost. Yeah, you know, there's no automatic process, behavior, yeah. there's no even sense of fear, it's just straight to addiction. There's a belief inside of us that causes us to automatic suppress and we don't even think about it. There's hardly any, you know, there's no thoughts going on at this point. Yeah. We're just suppressing it immediately. Yeah, mm. yeah. And you're <coughs> saying that's where most people live. Mm -hmm. um, but then we have this choice now as adults to open up and to stop suppressing fear. Uh, and we have to go through a process of removing the addiction or well, not it, Well, them. there's a lo lot of layers which we can yeah. talk about later, but yeah. they ro range from De complete denial and wanting to no longer deny even intellectually that you have, must have some yeah, yeah. right the way through to denial of the fear itself 
right, which is all about your addiction. So in other words, you deny that you have any addictions. That yes. you, you think that all the things you do are in complete desire when none of them are. They're all in basically complete addiction. Yeah. And once you realise that, you then go through acknowledging your addictions and so forth, and then you get to emotionally feel what the results are of most of your addictions and how icky you know they feel how bad they feel to mm. you and then you go through that process and then now you come to some acknowledgement of of your fears yeah and once you start getting to that place that you often feel exhausted and you feel because you can't go fighting. yeah because you can't go back to your addictive processes yep. or suppression yep. but but you're also not yet going into your fear and so you you're now in this state where you're now starting to feel anxious about having to go through your fear but you don't want to revert back to other behaviors that are all suppressing your fear yeah. and this is layer upon layer that you need to go through in order to get to the stage where you feel your fear and most people but have not got to that state no most people have heard us for six years haven't got to that state they're still heavily in their addictions or denial of their addictions yeah um usually that's the state that most people maintain for most of their life on earth mm. Uh, but presumably when we get past that final barrier that you talked about, mm -hmm. of like willfully trying to, without using any addictions, just trying to hold on. Yes. Um, when we go over into now experiencing the fear that we've suppressed for so long. Yes, and to do that, you have to have released all of these barriers to doing so. All the stuff you put, the beliefs and the addictions and all of that stuff. Correct. But that process is presumably much more relieving. Yes, you, you have extreme relief actually. Your body goes through this relaxation process uh, you, on that particular subject, whatever that subject is that you're releasing your fear about, and you, your whole life changes instantly. Actually, all of your attractions change instantly. Mm -hmm. uh, so once you really feel some of your fear, all of your attractions change instantly. The way in which you interact with every person around you on that particular subject is instantly changed. Mm -hmm. You see the world completely differently. You see how God's created it completely differently than what you thought. And, and what was guiding your every thought and every feeling before and every action before and every word before now isn't guiding all of those things anymore. So you're far more free to allow for uh, new experiences, new, new feelings, new thoughts that you were completely blocked to up until that point. So, so it's an incredibly freeing experience once mm -hmm. you actually get to feeling some of the fear. Yeah. yeah. It sounds it's a, very attractive. Well, it is very attractive. <laughs> and, and that's the sad thing is that most people don't realise how attractive it is. Um, they don't realise how, how, how big the benefits are to actually getting to the point of feeling and experiencing your fears as they truly are. Uh, it is such a freeing experience that it changes your entire life, in fact. In fact, the only opposition to truth and love is fear in most cases. It's not grief, mm -hmm. it's fear of mm -hmm. grief. You know, so, so once you don't have any fear at all, you will process all of your emotions pretty much instantly yeah. and therefore you will have no resistance to love and truth yeah. inside of you. Yeah. And, and that's a beautiful place to be. You can get to the point where you can process every single thing as it occurs and not even have a negative experience while you do so, mm -hmm. once you've received enough of God's love to be in that condition. But while you've got fear, you will never never get into the state of being in the condition of being at one with God and therefore never get into the state where you'll actually have permanent pleasure. Mm. Yep. Mm. So there are so many positive benefits of going through your fear. So many. Uh, and we can't list them all, obviously. No. Uh, but there are just so many in terms of how it changes your life, how it changes the life of people around you, how it affects your impressions on the environment, how it affects your projections onto the environment, how it affects the, every single living creature around you, how it affects every single organism that's within your body. Mm -hmm. All of those organisms change in their operation once you release fear on certain subjects. So it, there, there are so many changes that occur with that one, with that one proper release that uh, once you've done it once or twice, the average person, they'll, they'll not resist it anywhere near as much as they, they have done in the past. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is getting a person to actually go through it at least once. <laughs> What's the famous quote? Someone, some great leader somewhere on, in the history of the earth said, the, oh, maybe it was Martin Luther King, I don't know. The, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like that, you know. 
Yes, yeah, so I think a lot of the times people have a large amount of fear about feeling fear. Yeah. So I wouldn't call that fear of fear. I would call it a fear of feeling the sensation yes. of fear, yeah. Yeah. which is a which is really a fear of pain yeah. that people are expressing. And and I feel that if you have so much fear, you will never and, and you don't ever release it. You will never experience the joy and peace that comes from the release of fear mm. and and your whole life will change in so many ways that most people it's impossible for most people to even understand how many ways their life will change once they release fear yeah, the yeah. life changes in so many ways it's, there's so many almost uncountable ways that life changes that you become conscious of after you've gone through the experience yeah yeah, yeah. and and you also have faith generally after the experience. You have faith that processing emotion actually has a positive benefit. Until people go through their fear, they normally don't have that faith at all. I, I feel it's difficult to have faith in even the goodness of God and the world around Correct. us when we live in fear. Correct. It's impossible to have real faith with fear. Yeah. Fear, as you, relieve, you get more faith, fear, you automatically find that you, you have less fear. Mm. Or, or I, should, I should say that it often happens the opposite way around. As you get rid of fear, you then gain more faith through mm. the process. If people would only make the start, yeah. and it's like a lot of the things with regard to divine truth, if they'd only make the start, <laughs> <laughs> then they'd realise the benefits and, and most people have yet to make a true start when it comes to actually allowing themselves to experience the fear that's within them. And it's where theory becomes practice and knowledge, isn't it? Correct. It, it's that's the, yeah. that start where emotion, real emotions begin, yes. long suppressed emotions begin to flow yes. and not just dealing with addictions, but that yes. is when truth comes to us, isn't yes, it? Yes, you will not know anything about emotions at all while you retain large amounts of fear in your soul that you don't experience. Mm. You must go through the experience of feeling your emotions before you'll start to understand a lot of things like desire and a lot of things like sadness and other emotions and addictions and all these other things you won't understand. So it would just be an intellectual presentation. It won't be things you understand until you go through the feeling the actual feeling of your fear. Yeah. And this is why I say to people that feeling your fear is one of the most important things that you can do to come from a condition of sin into a condition of perfection. Mm -hmm. and, and fear is an enemy to your perfection. And rather than seeing it as something you should fear, you need to see it as something that you need to embrace so that it's no longer the enemy that you make it. So that's why I gave some talks about fear is your friend. Yeah. Fear tells you when you have false beliefs that are out of harmony with love. Fear tells you what you need to do inside of yourself. Fear is a, a friend in that regard, yeah. but, but it's a friend only if we allow its experience. Yeah. If, we, if we hold on to its experience and suppress its experience, it becomes a terrible enemy to our well-being then. Mm -hmm. But fear has the potential of being our friend as long as we embrace the process. And it, and it is, in fact, something that God helped us to, you know, God created the potential of these emotions. God didn't create the emotion of fear. So I must point that out. Yeah. The emotion of fear has only ever been created by humanity. And um, God does not have the emotion of fear inside of, inside of God at all. Yeah. And God does not engender fear inside of any one of God's creations. Yeah. So there's no need to fear God, for example. <laughs> God, God, though, created the potential through your free will for you to go into belief systems emotionally that are out of harmony with love and truth. Mm -hmm. And that means then that God created the, the potential for you to create fear. Mm. And fear is mankind's own creation. Mm. Perhaps that's a good way, place to leave it because our next question is going to be about sure. how fear, how is, fear created. is created. Yeah. yeah, that'd be good. How is fear created? Well, there are numerous ways uh, of how fear is created. Um, but maybe if we look at four primary ways that fear is created, it'll give everyone a bit of an idea of where it actually comes from as an emotion. Firstly, um, fear is created whenever love is withdrawn. Mm -hmm. 
So this is a very important factor that most people need to understand about fear. Usually when we're in a situation where love, the feeling of love has been withdrawn from us, and by this I mean the feeling of love that we could feel before that situation began yes. is withdrawn from us because of the situation, mm -hmm. we then have a tendency to fear the situations that cause the withdrawal of love. So, so maybe we could have some examples, yes. just some simple examples that are physical in nature. Yep. So let's look at a sample of, like I'm afraid of a spider. Mm -hmm. Most people are not actually afraid of spiders when they're young, when they're little. In fact, many of people have probably have memories of picking them up and looking at them in wonder. But when a parent has come along and expressed anger, rage, and even sometimes violence towards the child for picking up the uh, spider, now there is a direct connection in the child between the actual physical thing they've picked up, the spider, yeah. and the withdrawal of love, the, which is the fear-based expression of the parent. Yeah. So the, the parent has gone into violence, or at least into rage, mm -hmm. or fear, mm -hmm. which all cause the withdrawal of love. Mm -hmm. And when we have withdraw love withdrawn from us, most people have, feel that quite terribly when we have love withdrawn. And as a result, we now link the withdrawal of love to the event. Yeah. So in other words, instead of blaming the withdrawal of love on the fact that our mum or dad are being stupid, <laughs> <laughs> or the fact that they have got fear or whatever else, the little mind, you know, the child's mind doesn't make all of those assumptions. It just has a very simple re e equation within it. And that is, I took an action, I picked up a spider, mum and dad went berserk, yeah. right? And perpetrated all of these unloving actions towards me. As a result, I now feel afraid of the spider yeah. because love has been withdrawn. Mm -hmm. So that's a large reason why love gets withdrawn, uh, why fear yeah. gets created. The, the withdrawal of love from the individual. Mm -hmm. and, um, and most people uh, who have childhood fears and childhood, what do we call them now? Um, where, where phobias, phobias yeah. uh, they are all caused by the withdrawal of love in certain situations. So the reason why someone might be afraid of a snake or a spider or any physical creature is usually always being caused by the withdrawal of love in the same situation. And of course I'm sure we could go into many other subtleties or, or not so subtle things but less tangible things couldn't we in childhood um, where a child is in a situation where maybe even mum and dad are just having an argument yes. and love, they don't feel there's a love. There's a withdrawal of love in an argument. And so then there's an association and fear exists so, around whatever the... So now there's an association in the child yeah. regarding relationship yeah. with the opposite gender. Yeah. And whenever there's a raising of voices or whatever, they, they know fear is going... They, through their fear, the fear is created because yeah. they, they believe now love will be withdrawn. Yes. So, so somebody might, might be able to be sort of angry and not sin, you know. So mm -hmm. somebody might be angry and just go into a room and just express their anger. Yeah. But the person who's sitting outside who's had that childhood experience will feel love's being withdrawn from me now. I'm afraid. I'm, I'm afraid. afraid. I'm What's afraid. Gonna happen? What's yep. wrong with that person? And this yep. is why a lot of people are afraid of a person who feels their anger, even if that person feeling their anger is doing so in complete harmony with love and truth. Yeah. So, so, so this is the sad part about what happens emotionally is we have all of these things about, from the withdrawal of love, all of these associations have made emotionally inside of the child, which then causes the child to falsely believe that certain things will occur. Mm -hmm. And then of course, when that child grows to be an adult, the childlike emotion is frozen at the point that it's created. Yeah. So in other words, if it was a three-year-old experience, the child is going to act like a three-year-old in every one of those experiences, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Until that emotion is released. Yeah. So, so if a, a person goes into a room and expresses rage, the child who has net to release this fear of the anger between mum and dad and how it was expressed is going to go into terror about somebody even doing something that's quite safe. Yeah. And, and, and so therefore the, child, the, the adult is really acting like a child at the same age. <laughs> yeah. Which is another way, problem with fear in that fear has, when it's created, has created at the age it's created. Yeah. So, so this is why we have unreasoning fears with regard to some phobias. Mm -hmm. Because at the age those phobias were created, we couldn't reason. And as a result, it's like this terrible terror goes through us 
Uh, and it's very childlike because, you know, we're an adult now with this little tiny spider and we're afraid. What's going on, you know, yeah. or a mouse or whatever it is that we're afraid of. Yeah. And, and these are all because of the associations are now locked within us mm -hmm. at the age in which they were created. Yeah. And so that's why we have such an unreasoning uh, response to the emotion yeah. flowing. Yeah. And that's why we want to suppress it. Yeah. 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 Okay. So there's the withdrawal of love that can create fear. What else can create fear? The second thing is the withdrawal of truth. Of course, truth and love from God's perspective go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. they, they are joined. And as a result of that, every time love is withdrawn, truth is usually also withdrawn. And every time truth is withdrawn, love is also usually withdrawn. So in a childhood experience, you know, it could be where we went home, for example, and, and we told mummy and daddy that we told our next door neighbour they weren't very nice because that's what mummy said, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, mummy then goes berserk, yeah. uh, telling us that we should have lied. Uh -huh. Now truth is withdrawn and love is withdrawn in that moment. Yeah. So now we'll become very afraid of telling somebody the truth. Yeah. Very afraid. And that fear will be locked up at that age. Yeah. So if it happened when I was five, I will feel like a five-year-old every time I'm put in a position where somebody's asking me for the truth. Mm -hmm. Every time. Yeah. I'll feel like a five-year-old because that emotion has yet to be released from me. And, and so I am going to have the feeling that something terrible is going to happen by telling the truth. Mm. Right? So this is the sad effect of truth being withdrawn. It causes fear to then class changes our filter. Yeah. And therefore, we then, we then think and feel that every time truth is confronted, we will almost have a tendency to want to lie mm. automatically without even understanding why. Yeah. Uh, uh, with that example, having truth withdrawn, I was just um, wondering about things like racism or um, things where there is no truth coming from our environment as a child mm -hmm. on a certain issue. So truth is withdrawn in that sense. There's no truth about uh, that everyone is one of God's children, that we're all equal. In yeah, I would classify that as another type of experience, which okay. is lies masquerading as truth, which is uh -huh. another, you know, which is, I think, the fourth one we've got on our list oh, here. Oh, okay, sorry, yeah. I'm jumping ahead, I didn't yeah. see that. Yeah. Because uh, to me, that kind of example is where lies, which is I'm big, better than you, is a lie, mm -hmm. and I'm better than you because I'm a different colour than you is a, is a, is a double lie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and those are lies masquerading curating as truth. They always cause fear to be created inside of the individual. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that's, uh, I feel that's that kind of flavour of the creation of, 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 of the fear-based emotion. Got you. Yeah. All right. So yeah. love's withdrawn, truth withdrawn, lies masquerading as truth. Lies masquerading as truth. Yeah. yeah let's talk about that a little yep. more. This is something that is well uh, done here on earth. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I Absolutely. say well done, it's sad that it's so well done. Yeah. But most people have no idea how many lies they're told in the course of a day that, that they then believe are truths. And unfortunately, they create fears within the soul. So for example, as an example, the snake's poisonous, it will bite you, right, is a lie masquerading as a truth. Mm -hmm. But snakes don't want to bite you. Yeah. <laughs> they usually only bite when they're afraid. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So generally, a, a person who's not afraid of a snake can generally just pick up a snake and they'll be fine. Yeah. Right? So a snake will only bite you when they're afraid. Yeah. So that's the truth. Yes. But, but see, that's not what's said. Mm -hmm. What's said to the child is, it's a snake, it will bite you and it's poisonous. Yeah. In other words, you're going to die or you're going to get very sick if you, if you allow this snake to bite you. So you're better off killing the thing. Yeah, and right. certainly be very afraid <laughs> yes. of the snake. There's a feeling of, of needing to be afraid of this snake as a result, right? Yeah. And this is, this is, these are lies masquerading as truth. We don't understand, as adults many times, we don't understand the physical effect that has on the child. It enters the child as an emotion, mm -hmm. right, on a lot of levels. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, they then believe that for the rest of their life. They base many of their actions around it and mm -hmm. creates emotion within a child of fear. Yeah. about those particular things occurring. So if the parent has a fear of death mm -hmm. or a fear of getting sick, right, both fears are also lies. Yeah. 
there is no need to fear death because we continue living and there's no need to feel getting, fear getting sick because it, it's an indication there's something wrong emotionally it's just a response to an emotion there's no need to be afraid of it so there's no need to be afraid of any of these things right but the fact the parent has the fear means there's with often a com combination now occurring with the child the child has love withdrawn from it because their parents in fear the child is told a lie which is another withdrawal it's a withdrawal of truth, mm -hmm. another fear. And the child is, ha, have truth, has lies masquerading as truth presented yeah. to it. In other words, now there's three different creators in the one event yeah. of why the child has so much fear. And it's all emotional. Mm -hmm. It's all stuff now that's been created emotional through the event. And, and man, it, it makes it very, very difficult for the child later in life to actually deal with the phobia of snakes. Yes because yes. there's all these lies and there's, there's yes. all this truth withdrawn and there's all this love withdrawn all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and of course the child is going to feel quite confused and often not only confused but quite distressed yeah. about those circumstances and because it's distressed and then suppressed mm -hmm. it's locked up that emotion at that age. Yeah. So now the, the adult 35 years old looks at a snake and responds as if it was three years or four years old. Yeah. It responds in the same way, yeah. with the same responses. Even though it's now an adult is able to protect itself, there's nothing to fear, it has more control over its environment than it did when it was a child. Even though all those things are true, mm -hmm. the, child, the adult doesn't think those things are true because it's thinking like a child. Yeah. Because the emotion of the child, which is locked up inside the adult, is driving the entire proceeding. Yeah, so you're actually saying that fear is created when these events happen when we're a child. And then you're saying, and then it's usually suppressed, which means that we carry that fear. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So yep. Um, fear is created, and as we mentioned in the previous question, we have the opportunity just to feel it and it will be gone. Um, but usually it's suppressed, and so these things that happen when we're adults, when we begin to feel afraid, it's not the creation, that's not creating fear. It's the thing that was suppressed. The original creation happened a long time ago. Yes. Presumably if we were a child and we allowed, we were allowed to feel the fear as it was created. Well, by definition, that's probably not going to be the case <laughs> because uh -huh. most parents inculcate these particular fears inside into the child and suppress them on purpose. Yeah. So it's very unlikely that the child feeling all of that fear would have been allowed to experience it. Because it is the parent's own suppressed fear that is generating the fear in the child. And also generating the withdrawal of love, the withdrawal of truth, and the lies masquerading as truth. So, so all of these things are happening because of the parent's condition. It's highly unlikely the parent then is going to allow the child to feel it. <laughs> because the parent hasn't even learnt to allow itself to feel it. Yeah. So, yeah. so the reality is that yes, in theory, if the child was allowed to experience all of those emotions, it would have been fine. But in practice, it's not allowed to experience all of those emotions. And that's why the parent is, is pushing these things on the child in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, in practice, yes. it, it, it's very highly unlikely for the child to go through a complete experience where they are allowed to feel the fear in the moment that the fear is created. Mm. Okay, let's talk about the fourth way that mm -hmm. fear is created. Mm -hmm. um, so this is having codependent addiction masquerading as love. Yes. This is a juicy one. Yes, so remember, if we look at, there's a relationship between everything we're looking at. So remember I said there's withdrawal of truth mm -hmm. and then there's the lies masquerading as truth. Yep. So with regard to truth, they are the two sources, the primary sources of damage to the child in terms of fear. Uh -huh. With love, there's love being withdrawn yeah. or lies masquerading as love, which is addictions masquerading as love. Uh -huh. So it's the same principle. Yeah. So, so this fourth principle, which is lies masquerading as love or really addictions masquerading as love. In other words, nice feelings masquerading as the real nice feelings. <laughs> yeah. so fake nice feelings masquerading as real nice feelings. So, so this is uh, the kind of feelings that cause a shutdown inside of the person with fear. So, so for an example, the child starts to feel something from this environment, right? And becomes a little afraid of what's going on. The parent picks up the child and hugs the child mm -hmm. and says, there, there, you don't have to feel this, right? 
In that moment, the parent is in an addictive masquerade of love with the child. They're not really loving the child because the real love of the child would allow them to experience their own terror and fear. Would they pick up the child? They may pick up the child, but mm -hmm. they would never go there for you would never don't have to feel this fear. Yeah. They, say, You're they okay would allow the fear to be yeah. felt. Yeah. In fact, they would actually say the opposite. They'd yeah. say, you can feel this fear. Mm -hmm. right? They'd teach their child that they have the capacity to feel the fear. Yes. But when they go, no, 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 it's all right, it's all right, it's all right, all the parent's really doing is allaying their own fear. Yeah. Right? So the parent is teaching the child to suppress fear through the masquerade of love. Mm -hmm. Addiction, in mm -hmm. other words. Mm -hmm. They're teaching the child to become addicted, right? Which is always going to create worse situation and more fear. Yeah. Right? Very, very damaging thing to do to the child. And it's often these, these so-called loving things that we do to the child, which are actually addictions, that are the more damaging mm -hmm. because they are harder to unravel. Mm -hmm. It's often easy for the child to see when love with was withdrawn than it is for the child to see when there was an addiction masquerading as love. Yes. And it's often easier for the child to see when truth is withdrawn mm -hmm. than it is for the child to see a lie masquerading as truth. Yes. So the problem with the masquerading emotions is that they create further things to unravel intellectually and emotionally for the child. Mm -hmm. And this is why it's sometimes more difficult to recover from a, a so-called non-abusive, quotation, loving environment, yeah. which is really all based around addictions and lies, yeah. than it is to recover from a blatantly unloving and untruthful environment where somebody has been abused. Mm. And, and this is the problem that we face, is that the reason why it's often easier to recover is because the masquerade is more difficult to detect than the actual withdrawal. Yeah. And this is a problem with recreation of fear. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, most of our fears revolve around the masquerade, not around the withdrawal. Yeah. So, so what we end up f having is these deep masquerades of love and, and lies masquerading as truth. So addictions masquerading as love and life masquerading as truth. And we see these two things in, in the life going on and we believe them to be truth and love. And then we don't understand why we have so much fear. Yeah. The reality is we have huge amounts of fear related to those things because they are all masquerades and they're, they are very, very difficult to unravel. And they've given us false definitions of what is real, Correct. what is really truth and what is really love. They and have totally distorted reality from God's perspective. And so, of course, we're going to live in a lot of fear. Yes. Uh, when you live in total distortion of reality from God's perspective, you will have lots of fear. Mm -hmm. And you won't even know it. Mm -hmm. You won't even know it. You'll think you'd have none, in fact. You think you'll be brought up by a loving, uh, ha happy family and loving environment. But as soon as somebody starts triggering you, the emotions that are triggered show you, wow, this is painful. Yeah. This shows me I, I must have had a lot of stuff masquerading going on yeah. if this is such a painful experience. And this is often the cause of, of deep d diseases that kill you. So mm -hmm. cancers, for example, are a lot about lies masquerading as truth and, and addictions masquerading as love. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you trace them back to their sources, you'll see generally that's what's occurred in the families of people who get cancers. Mm. And, and they are very, very damaging emotions that cause the destruction of your physical body along with the harm to your soul and the harm to the soul of those creating them. And, and yet we have often no idea that they're occurring. In fact, many, most, of, uh, most of society believes that many of the lies are true yeah. and that many of the addictions are love. Yeah. And you see this all the time. So and you everywhere. see it, you know, you see it in television shows, you see it in newspaper clippings, you see it, you see it in the way society works yeah. even. There's all these addictions that are masquerading as love and lies masquerading as truth. And, and the majority of us have a sense that it's something wrong. And also the majority of us are in a lot of pain as a result of these things occurring. And yet we make no change because there's a lot of fear associated with them. Yeah. And, and it is very difficult to confront the masquerade. In fact, it's the confrontation of the masquerade that is often more explosive than just the confrontation of the facts. Yes. Right? 
or, you know, in other words, knowing that you've had with love or truth withdrawn is a confrontation of the fact. A confrontation of the masquerade is you, you've had love and truth withdrawn, but they th say that you haven't. Yeah. And that's a, con a confrontation of the masquerade. And that is very, very difficult. And, and usually that's when all sorts of family issues come up. You know, families don't talk to each other for years and years because when you start confronting the masquerade, yeah. most families want to keep the masquerade. Yes. Uh, whereas a family generally who's withdrawn love and truth will be honest and say, yeah, I probably didn't love you or yeah. I, I probably didn't you know, care about you. That's yeah. true. <laughs> and know. for the individual, that helps them to uh, be more honest which helps them with their fear. Yes. Whereas when there's an ongoing denial of the very situation that generated the fear, yes. it is much harder to begin to, there's a whole other range of fears that have to be gone through in order to connect with. Well, you have to unravel all of the addictions. Yeah. And, that, that, and the addictions are going to be intense when there's lies masquerading as truth and, and addictions masquerading as love. Yeah. The addiction level is going to be intense to feel. Yeah. And as a result, many people who start that process, you know, take four or five years before they get beyond that process, even when they're doing it sincerely. Yeah because there is a lot to unravel yeah. and, and it's because of the masquerade. Yeah. So it's one thing to do a certain thing, it's another thing to lie about it and tell the person that it didn't happen, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even yeah. though it did happen. It's like, it's like punching someone in the nose and telling them it didn't happen. Yeah. Yes. And, and that's a lot worse than punching someone in the nose and actually saying, yeah, I did do that. <laughs> Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, and uh, often there's a fear of even saying, no, you did punch me in the nose, because there's a fear of another punch in the nose. Correct, um, yes. Uh, Not only another punch in the nose, but a complete denial and ridicule of the fact that you believed it happened. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just so damaging, it just causes so many layers of problems inside of the soul. And this is the major creator of these fears. Mm. So fear is mostly created by those fourth series of events occurring. Yeah. And usually it's not one of them by themselves. It's uh -huh. usually, one, you know, usually in tandem or all four occurring at the same time yeah. that causes most of our fear. So just to recap, mm -hmm. there's having love withdrawn. Yes. Having truth withdrawn. Yes. Having codependent addiction masquerading as love. Yes. And having lies masquerading as truth. truth. Yes. And you sort of highlighted them with some physical examples, but obviously all of these things apply in terms of the emotional environment. Far more so. Yeah. Far more so apply emotionally. You know, yeah. the, what happens emotionally is far worse often than the physical. Sometimes, though, it helps us to look at a physical event and say, oh, well, yeah, I can see it quite plainly occurring there. Yeah. But from an emotional perspective, yes, yeah, far more serious. Because, because most people are desensitised from their emotions as well, mm. which means that we are not sensitive to the fact that these particular things have occurred emotionally. And that makes it very, very difficult for us to, to actually really face our true fears. Mm -hmm. And so for most people, the majority of their true fears are emotional. They're not physical <laughs> in nature or intellectual in nature. They're all emotional. They are all based on belief systems that are deeply ingrained emotionally inside of them as a result of those four things being engaged by their environment, by people in their environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. You know, you, you get it at school, you get it at work, you get, but when a child's growing up, obviously it's mostly at home and at school. Mm -hmm. And both schools and home generally encourages the lie masquerading as truth and the, the addiction masquerading as love. Mm. And unfortunately, uh, it causes huge amounts of damage to the child. So by the time we're 12, 13, 14, 15, we've got so much damage that now there's law of attraction going on. Where, so the God's law of attraction is bringing to us a consciousness of this damage. But we're in so much denial of even trying to be conscious of it at that age. Mm -hmm. Many times it's not until our pain increases to such a point, and usually that starts occurring during our 30s or 40s or 50s, that we start analysing what actually happened during our childhood. Mm. Mm. Very thorough, thank mm. you.